And thank you for joining us here on The Factor on Censored tonight. We begin with all of the violence that unfolded in Houston this holiday weekend. And while we were on a break here on The Factor, it was just heartbreaking to see it. Multiple deadly shootings happening hours within each other. And according to investigators, the cases all involved domestic violence. One of those cases made national headlines. An ex-husband interrupted a Thanksgiving party a family gathering, shooting and killing his ex-wife and another man. 38-year-old Yonesti Montiel Granado has been arrested for the crime. He's also injured two others in that case. Let's talk about it. Trauma therapist Chow Wen and domestic violence survivor Jamie Wright both join us here on The Factor on Sense. First of all, Jamie, let's bring you in. When you saw this kind of violence happening, people are celebrating Thanksgiving family, one of the happiest times of the year, and someone comes in with a gun and just ruins that because of their mindset, because of the way they think, because they think that is love and they don't want to let that person go. Seeing that, what did that do for you? Solidifies the fact that we have to keep having the hard conversations um, like we're having tonight that violence like hurt people hurt people and that there's got to be a way to do it it breaking loose from a violent situation, a violent relationship, a different way. We've got to keep saying that over and over and letting people know that there is resources av available. Not only the person that's experiencing the harm, but also resources available for the person that's causing the harm. So just solidifies that I have to keep going. And what was your darkest moment? Take us back to that time when you went through domestic violence and you said, I have to make a change. What happened to you and what put you on the path to walking away from it all? The darkest moment was at the point where I thought that my um, ex was going to take my life and I thought that my two daughters was going to bury me as a result of me saying something to him that he didn't like. Um, and that's incredible. You're thinking already that far ahead that my children will have to bury me. Yes, sir. It's, it was definitely a reality. In my situation, yes. And so, child, we see these kinds of incidents, these kinds of tragedies in our city all the time, but it gets worse in the holidays because those who, the abusers, those who take control of people, lose that control. In, and, yeah. and, and, and they're in a dark place. Very dark. At the foundation of domestic violence turned deadly is the total loss of power and control. In these cases, what we think we know is that the perpetrator stormed in the house and killed somebody that he knew very well. Apparently, they shared a child together. There was another child in the house. A 15-year-old was shot. A man was shot. That entire family dinner get-together was terrorized because of that night. And did you know last year there were 204 domestic violence homicides in the state of Texas, 75% of which happened inside the victim's home. So that statistic holds very true in this case of domestic violence Thanksgiving homicide. How horrible is it that during the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, what have you, that there are stress figure factors, just like there are during COVID, right? That the stress factors of, of inflation, of finances, of a perpetrator staying home with his victim and a victim staying home because the holidays can be very stressful, can, uh, can escalate into such violence. We do need to shed light. We appreciate you continuing to come on Isaiah, uh, day after day, night after night, to talk about this issue, to let survivors know they doesn't have to be this way, they don't have to be alone, there is help. And when you have individuals who may get away, those who may do everything that they're told to do, get out of the situation, get out of the house, leave the marriage, leave the relationship, and this monster still follows them. That monster follows them yeah. and still claims their lives. So many victims do the right things. They file protective orders. The justice system meant to protect them may not protect them. They leave, and we know leaving can be the most dangerous time. It's in within those critical weeks and months that a perpetrator, an abuser, loses that power and control and says, I'm going to exercise the ultimate power and control. I'm going to take your life. And oftentimes, they take their own lives. Absolutely. And when we talk about the individual who has the power, 
and you as a victim or a survivor got out of the relationship, should you always have your guard up for that person if they are a dangerous person, if they are, if they are a violent person? Absolutely, Isaiah. In, in my humble opinion, I'm my, my, my best advocate. I'm the person that is, is aware of my surroundings, aware of the danger that I could be in. So absolutely, still to this day, I'm very much aware of the possibility that, you know, he's still out there. He's, he's very much still out there. He's very much still having to live with the fact that he no longer has power and control over me. Survivors got a plan for their safety. We stress something called safety planning. You know, where are the keys? What's your exit plan? What's your code word? Who are your friends that you can talk to? We hate that the onus has to be on the victim to protect him or herself, but oftentimes it's necessary and it's imperative. And it's in your best interest. Can save and your life. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who may take the route of getting a restraining order, Many people find that that's extra work. We're putting this person in the court system. I don't know if I want to do that. But would that be a good idea to have that constant restraining order on that person who could do you harm? You know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. We know that a lot of survivors are in real serious danger, which is why protective orders are there. But we also know survivors can heal and uh, get counseling, supportive counseling, like the work we do as a trauma therapist. Um, it really is a case-by-case -case basis and the severity of your safety, and that can be done by a safety assessment, by community-based organizations, by counselors. And for those who would want more information on your organization, where can they go, Chow? Uh, they can go to your website. Uh, I work at GEM Wellness and Counseling. I also work at the Texas Family Nurse Examiners, and uh, we have free support there as well. All right. Jamie Wright, Chow Wynn, thank you both for joining us here on the